What's shaking and baking, all you hip, cool cats? My name is Kit, and welcome one and all to Chicago Reacts. Please be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe, and hit that ring bell notification. That way, all of you are made aware we upload new content onto our YouTube channel. And without further ado, let's talk about what we're going to be looking at. It looks like a fun series called Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous Review by Mandalore Gaming. So, as always, folks, we give the original link. Uh, to all the videos that we re that we react to, I stuttered there for a minute, that we react to, uh, in the description box below. So please do the right thing. Be a hip, cool cat in my book and support the original content creators. A lot of time and effort is made into making these awesome videos. And the best thing you can do is support the original content creators because, hey, spread the word. Tell people, hey, check out this awesome YouTube channel. There you go. That's all you got to do. And, hey, be sure to give a like to us, too. We... We we're so grateful for this awesome audience that we're building on this great YouTube channel of ours. But now, without further ado, since I'm in charge of the ones and twos, uh, let's pull up this video, Pathfinder, Wrath of the Righteous Review by Mandalore Gaming, as always. Let's go ahead and check it out. Grab yourself a tasty snack and a tasty beverage, and let's get ready to play this video in a three, a two, a one. Whoa! What in the name of the Green Mother's going on in this crazy town? Interesting. After the rabbit hole of adventuring that was Kingmaker, the sequel has now been out long enough to receive its own enhanced edition. And as you might expect, Whoa. it is a dense, gelatinous cube of features. Once again, part CRPG, part City Builder, part Empire Builder, and part Heroes of Might and Magic 3. So the ambition is high. Compared to Kingmaker, Whoa. some areas have been streamlined down for convenience, and others that were intricate before have now reached new levels of complexity. Mm. Story-wise, it's also not a direct sequel. It takes place in a completely new land, and besides some easter eggs, you can start here just fine. I will say that while it's different okay. story-wise, tonally, this does feel like a sequel. Kingmaker had a good amount of low-stakes murder hoboing through the woods. <laughs> or having rope and tools mattered, and it felt like playing Pathfinder with your friends. Even ruling the kingdom, you did have a variety of issues to deal with, but it wasn't super high stakes until the end game. In Wrath of the Righteous, demons from another dimension invade four minutes into the game. The tutorial forest has become the tutorial urban war zone, oh, with wow. demons leaving IEDs in the street and crusaders deciding whether or not to burn children. With that as their starting point, you can imagine the kind of heights it developed. Ow. Oh, well, hey. In Warhammer 40k, we call that just a Tuesday develops into. In turn, what your character can become to deal with that can also get pretty nuts. So it does feel like a natural ramp up as a sequel, and it still has the tons of adventuring side content you'd expect, but if you're completely new, it's a deep end start that won't waste time getting going. The good news is that the tutorial and general onboarding stuff for learning is much better this round. And sure, you still might feel compelled to hire a CPA for dealing with a character creator, but the important thing is it's not GURPS. No, I meant it's more clear than before, which is good when your game has this many interlocking systems. All right, uh, so folks, uh, as always, I like to open this uh, floor up to the experts, uh, to the Pathfinder people that have played, uh, I guess, the previous game, and I guess this game as well, Pathfinder, or Wrath of the Righteous. Um, I'm interested to hear your stories. Uh, what's it like playing the game? Uh, overall, how, what tactics do you use? Who are your favorite uh, characters to play as, or what roles or jobs that you'd like to play as? Uh, how successful are you in building your empire? Um, are you righteous in your rule? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and yes, you know what? I need some lore experts to step up. I know that probably this video, it's pretty long. It'll go ahead and uh, go ahead and detail about what's happening. But I would like uh, maybe a summary of what the overall story is. Uh, so be sure to put in detailed paragraphs, proper punctuation, all that good stuff. And uh, type, type, type in the comment section below. Systems. There's a good amount of stuff to cover, so for now, let's step back and look at the character creator. There are so many options that, for an alarming amount of people, oh, wow. they spend the most hours on this. Human, elf, dwarf, gnome, halfling, half elf, half orc, a seminar, tiefling, or oh wow. Hey, look! If you take away the sun at the bottom, it's just kit. That's that's an awesome, uh, awesome, uh, awesome thing. I guess. I am, I am, I am now official, or, you know, <laughs> Kitsune, 
or I mean, maybe maybe that's a uh, I don't know how you pronounce it, but I'm gonna pronounce it the way I see it. Kitsune. There you go. Take away the S U N E, and uh, yours truly is in the game. It's part of the game. They play an hour or two, get tempted thinking about something else, and come back to the paperwork. Kingmaker already had a lot of options for classes and subclasses, and Wrath has amped all of those up. There are plenty of new archetypes and brand new prestige classes. And what existed before has new feats, spells, abilities, you name it. To give an example, there are now over a dozen animal companion options, including dinosaurs. Whoa! Oh my god. You get to have a Triceratops or a Velociraptor? Oh, please tell me you get to have T-Rex. Or a dragon. That'd be cool. Which sounds fun on its own, but Wrath has also added a mounted combat system. Meaning, it's viable to ride a Triceratops into battle. Or, forgo that for a traditional horse, just make sure to pick your knightly order. Though even beyond class-specific options, there are now tons of background- I'm- I'm- I'm gonna want a dinosaur. Okay, for those of you who don't know, I'm sorry, I know I'm pausing early on, but, uh, yours truly was on not one, but three dinosaur expeditions, two to Montana and one to South Dakota. A long, long time ago, when I was in high school, back when I had hope. Back when I was idealistic and had hope. Grounds to choose from. These can get more specific or hyper-specific if you go for a regional one. Plus, some might only show up with specific races, which you've got a dozen of. They still ask your birth date. What's your religion? Are you allergic to shellfish? I swear these Pathfinder games are like the doctor's office clipboard of character creators. Good. Now you could use a pre-made, but come on. It's more in-depth and very welcome. Just having the backgrounds alone would be a huge improvement, but everything else was expanded on. It lets you fine-tune exactly what you want to be, which is great if you do have a plan. If you don't, it can be overwhelming. You can respect during the game, which is nice, but most people seem to want to start fresh. It's still the best example of where Wrath has added complexity for the better. The extra options give you more control and satisfaction in character progression. Leveling up lets you fine-tune things closer to where you want them to be, and an early choice like a bloodline can have new effects even at the end of the game. The general difficulty- Alright, I'll keep this question simple. Uh, just for one character that you played on, if to anyone that's played Pathfinder, Wrath of the Righteous, if you can go back into memory or look, pull up your character's stats, how did you fill your fill your character out? What 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 uh, race did you play them as? Their sub fact, you know, I guess their their job, what they did within that job. Were they allergic to sell, shellfish? I said, were they allergic to shellfish? There you go. Got it right the second time. Uh, you know, what, what were they overall like? What was their personality like? Type it in the comment section below. I like to hear uh what. How your character is uh, made up in this game. Multi settings are again extremely customizable, and the unadjusted normal setting is more generous this time around. This looks As like a lot of fun. Interested in like city building or army battles can also be completely automated, but I'll get more into that when I talk about it properly. Generally, the systems that were more streamlined down were for the more grand and epic theme. Like setting up a camp and resting still has skill checks for camouflage, cooking, and now lets you create potions or scrolls if you're skilled into it, but what you won't see are camping supplies. If the area is clear, you're free to rest. The only drawback is you'll start to feel the effects of demonic corruption until you sleep somewhere sanctified. It's just a worsening debuff that prevents you from sleep spamming. So it is less inventory management, but you're still forced to occasionally go back and recover somewhere secure. At least, okay. secure compared to Baphomet's Airbnb. See, Wrath takes place in the country of Mendev. It was a fairly unremarkable land until about a century ago. A powerful mage named Rilu Vorlesh tore open a hole in reality that led into the Abyss. The Abyss is a Pathfinder version of Hell, though Hell itself also exists. The difference is that Hell is a structured and ordered torture realm, complete with layers, just like everyone's favorite laugh-a-minute comedy. There's also Cthulhu and Chupacabras, because Pathfinder has everything. Anyhow, Very the Abyss good. is the Anything Goes Madness realm. Wow. There are a Cheesecake Factory menu amount of demon lords ruling over various sub-realms, but even in those, it's not really consistent. On a good day, you can be seized by a demon with more vowels in his name than a street in Hawaii, because you've been randomly selected to fight the Titan- Hold on. To our, our wonderful Hawaiian audience, if we have any. Uh, um, okay, so he mentioned street names are a little complicated in Hawaii. Okay, can, can I get an example? Type, type, type in the comment section below. I'd like to hear that. Or was he just joking around there? I know nothing about Hawaii. I hope someday to visit that beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, but uh, I don't think it's going to be happening anytime soon. But, you know, 
always curious to learn about new places. So shout out to our wonderful viewing audience members in the great state of Hawaii. Please take good care of yourselves. And uh, as always, keep your heads on a swivel and keep on being hip, cool cats from your friends in Chicago. In the arena, because that'll amuse whatever McDagon is strongest on your street that week. The abyss sucks. And hell is not involved in any of this. At least, not directly. Yes! When this rift was opened, it was dubbed the World Wound. Now, real quick, you know what would have made that better? If we saw a glorious Space Marine helmet. A Space Marine helmet of any of the loyalist Space Marine chapters. It had been glorious and beautiful. Long live Ultramar. Long live the Blood Angels. Long live the Dark Angels. The Lion has returned. Long live the Black Templar. There you go. And all the other wonderful Space Marine chapters. After all, Chicago Reacts is a pro-Imperium of Mankind channel. There's never once been any ounce of heresy from any of our reactors or anything in the comments section below. No heresy. 10 out of 10. Glory be to the Emperor. And abyss demons poured out of it. The land itself was horribly corrupted. It rained blood. It stormed blood. And neighboring nations, not wanting to be murdered or enslaved by citizens from the worst version of hell, began to send forces in to try and hold the demons back. The past century has had four declared crusades, and it's become a losing battle. While Glorious. the fourth crusade wasn't nearly as disastrous as the real-life one, it ended in a stalemate where crusaders barely held on to the fortified city of Canabras. And you start the game seeing it lit on fire. Mendev will have to hope that the fifth time is the charm, and you can lead the crusade to victory and close the world wound. But the core of its story isn't just winning, but how you win. Maybe you'll use the war to further your own goals. Now that you're caught up, let's talk visuals. Having made a game to learn and refine from, for a 3D isometric RPG, it's a great looking game. The lighting and- How did you launch your glorious crusade? Was it through honor and justice? Or did you fall to the foul temptations of chaos? Particular has gone through some improvements, and depending on the time of day, it can look downright gorgeous. Surfaces can reflect characters in the environment, and without needing any kind of proprietary ray tracing technology. Environments can be dark and moody, but they'll still make use of striking colors as well. It's an appropriate balance where dungeons can be dark and oppressive, but they'll twist things far enough to stop it from getting dull. It's also great for navigation, since while you do have a map, having the areas physically look different is helpful. Occasionally some things in the environment can look undercooked, like it was just a Kingmaker asset that was ported in, but overall the game looks rich and colorful. There were times where I was impressed by just how much detail they could pack into a scene. Like seeing the aftermath of some kind of blood ritual gone wrong, or maybe right? It hits a good balance for me, where things aren't so drab that it's dull, but not so colorful that it gets too cartoony. Effects like how the wind moves through the grass and trees, and the weather effects in general are also improved. You That's actually pretty cool here. I, I like that small attention to detail. Um, maybe it's not a fair comparison, but, um, you know, I remember when uh, Blizzard... Ugh. Back... Ah, ugh. Sorry, I, I feel sick not even mentioning their name. Uh... You know, with uh, Warcraft 3, the first one that came out, not that Reforged one, uh, but there was like, oh, like how night and day changed or the weather patterns. Um, I like that wonderful little add-on. Or with uh, Medieval 2 Total War, like how each of the map battles were different. Or even, hey, uh, Breath of the Wild, uh, Legend of Zelda. Um, I, I like that, that the environment changes and that you could see just how things change. I, I like that. I like that a lot. You now deal with some proper blizzards and storms, and weather of the more apocalyptic variety. These new effects, like heat waves and fog, have also made their way into the spellcasting. So magic can now look about as wild as magic should. Sometimes they go crazy with the particle effects. And it might be outrunning the engine at times, as I'd have an occasional slowdown or hitch while playing the game, and it was usually while using magic. As another nice bonus, you can actually rotate the camera now. I thought it was bizarre Kingmaker didn't have this when that plays to its strength as a 3D ISO game. That's fully implemented now, including areas that shift and change depending on where your camera's oriented, which we'll get to. Still, the game world looks great, and wow. there's a lot of variety to it. All the characters and creatures are also in about the same place. You can still see items down to what's equipped on your belt, and Kingmaker's Monster Menagerie has been expanded out with new weirdos. The gore is also as meaty as ever. Glorious. Yeah! Did you just die already? Good. <laughs> Did you see that? Not easy. I like that we saw a ferocious Smilodon. Now, the thing is, I saw Triceratops and I saw a Velociraptor. Please, tell me you can get a T-Rex. Alright? The, 
the world's most powerful land predator. Do not believe the propaganda about the Spinosaurus or Giganatosaurus. T-Rex was the boss, okay? Tyrant Lizard King. This is not open for debate. We here at Chicago React salute the Tyrant Lizard King. Was that? No. The general soundscape is also good. Combat sounds are still meaty and satisfying, and the horrible wet splat of Gallaghering some cultist's head never gets old. When it comes to music, the more grand tone has also carried over. The core of the soundtrack is a big epic choir and orchestra, which is in the usual wheelhouse for an RPG, but even with that, it still has good variation in how it's used. There are all kinds of directions you can take your character, and there's cool. themes for all of them. It can range from sounding like Kingdom of Heaven to a haunted house. Glory. I saw that Kingdom of Heaven reference. Love that. Ew, what is that? The game has a lot more music than its predecessor, including battle tracks, which is definitely the area it was lacking in the most. They can be more subdued, and there are pleasant, relaxing tracks like the tavern music, so it's not all doom choirs all the way through. I will say the over-the-top music is brought to its greatest heights by the over-the-top voice acting. The direction is so fun and sincere. It doesn't matter how silly or corny a line can be, they put their all into it. And with the music, sometimes you see magic. And as I stare into the flames of the rift itself, the answer still eludes me. What is the secret to this canker festering at the very heart of our world? How can we heal it? My blood runs in you. I can smell its scent. I was not aware Igefalus was able to continue his bloodline before he died. <laughs> Just in time. The place is a bit of a mess. And I haven't even poured the blood into the goblets yet. Not everyone here is fighting for Mendev and its queen, Fallen Paladin. When you crossed to the demon's side, you betrayed all mortal kind. And for that, you must pay. It's so refreshing, and the performances all around are excellent. Okay, awesome voice acting. I guess there's multiple endings, multiple choices, and I like that, having a wide variety of choices to choose from. Of course, I would be loyal to the side of order. I would never once, ever, ever deviate to the side of chaos. I mean, never, never to the realm of madness. I mean, even though there are sometimes the rumors of a fifth god, but there is no fifth chaos god. What? No, never. What? No, never, never. What? No. There are already plenty of great characters, but the audio work brings it to another level. Like, check this out. This is a smile you can hear. Since that night, Chief, Melround didn't even set eyes on it. While he was dealing with the Golem, I sneaked past them, and that was that. Awesome. Cool. Now on the gameplay side, you can break things up into a few sections. The first being your standard RPG adventure stuff, the second being event management, the third being city building, mm. and the fourth being army combat. These are all intertwined, so to make it simpler, I'm going to break it in half. The first half is still adventuring, but everything else I'm going to fold into being crusade management. Besides, for the first dozen or so hours, there's no management to think about. And if you never want to deal with it, it can still be set to automatic, though there are some flaws with that I'll get into. Anyways, the early stage is based around traveling the ruined city of Canabras. The last holdout is a fortified tavern, and your mission is to find survivors and regroup there in order to launch a counterattack. Not every faction is willing to work together, which is a good test run for the later parts of the game. The decisions you make here still matter and can be showing up 50 or more hours in, but overall, this is training wheels. Combat can change from real time with pause to turn based on the fly, but compared to Kingmaker, the game is made with turn based being in mind compared to a later edition. With how many skills and abilities that have been added, turn-based really seems the way to go this time. It is still nice that you can switch over to real-time for a trash fight, but as the challenge increases, the more it seems you need to play slow and tactical. 
While the main story is focused on demons, there is a great variety of combat encounters if you go looking for them. Whoa! The card to the main story, it does try to give you a variety of enemies. But some stages like Act 4 are going to be demon central. Exactly. So where Kingmaker's okay. story gave you a few flavors when it came to the main threat, here it is more limited unless you <gasps> go exploring. And you should. Is that it an undead woolly mammoth? Oh, that's so cool. Exploring Canabras is mainly an itinerary of different bombed out buildings which they do try to mix up a bit, and they'll have interesting events happening in the locations, but when the world opens up, you'll have a lot more variety. The campaign is staged out in a way where you're far less likely to encounter an enemy you can't handle. It can absolutely still happen, but it's far more rare compared to the predecessor. And since you can rest up more, that means more time out in the field. Good. There are tons of side missions and plenty other things to do that are completely unmarked, like diving into a small dungeon and fighting a mini-boss, or solving a quick mystery. Mm. You'll sometimes run across the mini-adventure modules too, which are purely based on choices and skill checks. So it won't all be combat, but there is a lot of combat. That said, some of the best non-combat content comes from your companions. Overall, your party's writing and character and development runs laps around Kingmaker. Rather than front or back loading their missions like before, they're spread out much more naturally throughout the campaign. You have a lot of companion options too, with some restricted to certain paths, and others being pretty hidden unless you fulfill certain conditions. Most of the characters are really fucking strange too, which I appreciate. For example, Darren could be your primary healer. He's a young, hedonistic count who's marked down as being neutral evil. In every sense, he's a spoiled, pampered asshole. As I... hold on. Hold on, since I'm in charge of the ones and twos, I get to do whatever I want. So, uh, first of all... It's a count who's marked down as being neutral evil. I, I have to say, that looks like one awesome party, and all those ladies look very, 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 very beautiful. Hmm. They look good. <laughs> in every sense, he's a spoiled, pampered asshole. As a child, I had my very own pony. But I always dreamed of having a lamb. I was never allowed one. Sheep were seen as peasant animals, utterly unsuitable for the scion of a noble line. The trauma haunts me to this day. How in the hell is he the healer? Well, his parties got so wild that he picked up healing magic to stop bodies from piling up. So he became a pro just to stop S&M malfunctions. Then you have Regil, who's a hell- Okay. Seems okay, I guess. Why not? Knight dedicated to brutally keeping order. He'll do some monstrous things for victory, and while he usually does it coldly, there is a sadistic side to him. He's also a gnome. Two more minutes left out in the open, and neither you nor I will have any troops left to order about Crusader. But the wounded... <gasps> ah! <laughs> Problem solved. Retreat to shelter. And now he and Darren are sleepover buddies. Such power. And it is bestowed upon an undisciplined whelp. We cannot abide waste. Quite right. I am too good for this little world. Thank you for noticing. There is also a talking weapon. A tiefling thief attached to some kind of evil spirit, a petty criminal turned paladin, a dwarf contract killer, some kind of borderline feral spider mutant woman, and, of course, the redeemed succubus who's actively trying not to murder and devour people again. Those are just some I can hold on. We all we all know that Spider Man meme where it's uh Toby Maguire playing Peter Parker where his suit's all torn up and it, it, in it is like I, I can fix her. This team, I could fix him. I can make him noble and just. I can fix him. Hold on. <clears throat> One more time. This time more delivery and strength. Look at me, guys. I can fix them. <laughs> Probably someone's going to type in the comment section below, Kit playing the game two weeks in. I can't fix these people. Some examples, and some characters I thought were bland could have some insane shit brewing beneath the surface. Understanding them makes replaying the game even more fun. They do a good and thorough job planning hints for later reveals. Their stories can develop into a few different ways, especially if you throw romance into the mix. Ooh. And yes, that includes the succubus. I know people who bought Dark Messiah just for that. You can still make a completely custom party, but this time around, I never felt tempted. They feel like a driving force of the story and have a lot of interactions depending on what you're doing. Sometimes they'll even argue with each other. And you can stay out of it, or take a side with skill checks, and it's rare that you can placate both sides. 
Managing the Crusade, they become advisors. They bring their own perspective for tackling dilemmas, and they usually make good back and forth points. When it comes to managing a war, a character you might not usually agree with can offer something really insightful. Some of the most thoughtful and interesting writing happens at these meetings. Whereas in Kingmaker, you choose an advisor's solution based on their personality. You have lots of opportunities to use your skill checks throughout the game, and failing them can still be fun. So, have any of you succeeded in being peacemakers when your team members don't agree with each other? Type, type, type your stories in dealing with your wonderful cast of characters. These interactions do start to taper off towards the endgame. Especially in your last talk with your party, I thought you'd have more options. It's not nearly as empty as Kingmaker's late game, but there is a noticeable lack of extra stuff to do, and options for them. It's still an improvement over only kingdom management. I did most of the quests I could my first playthrough, though I did have some companions dying off for job purposes. And that clocked to about 80 hours, but it easily could have been a dozen more. Kingmaker was longer, but it had stretches of not much happening. Wrath of the Righteous felt dense. The pacing of the main story is more under your control rather than waiting for stuff to happen. It's a more packed game, but also screaming at you to replay it. This is where the mythic paths come in, and these shake up the game like nothing else. They're not new classes, they're an entire second aspect to your character. Early in the game, you discover you have some kind of strange power attached to you. Okay. It's an incorporeal cosmic jello, but you do have some control in shaping it. The more obvious early routes can have you start to ascend towards being an angel or a demon. But as the game goes on, you have opportunities to lean in other directions. There are ten of these in total you can discover, so again, another good incentive to explore. The mythic wow. milestones are an entire other tree you level up in, with new spells, abilities, and everything else. Your companions also get some of your mythic power, and while they can't ascend like you can, they can enhance their own abilities. There are options like becoming an Eon, a Golden Dragon, or a Lich. I'm always on the hunt for good necromancer RPGs, and while you can't drown people with skeletons like Diablo 2, as far mm -hmm. as pure flavor goes, this might be the best necromancer RPG, even more so than Arcanum. It takes a while to become a full Lich, but it is a dark road. Oh, Beyond wow. Beyond getting some Dr. Manhattan tier obliteration magic, there are significant characters you can bring back from the dead if you decide to kill them. You can have a party made up of completely undead characters if you want, though unfortunately you can't bring your own companions back as undead if they disagree with you. They also rarely have anything to say and don't have the great party interaction that the living companions do. Which is a shame because some undead companions do not trust the undead. Companions were so tied to the main story in their life that they should have a lot more to say. Even despite that, it's still incredible. Beyond the ridiculous magic and abilities you get, the flavor for it is just so entertaining. Like you liberate a city from demons, but then the Royal Council is concerned because you're constructing an undead Tyrell building over it. So while you have the main story, your mythic story runs parallel with it and intersects it at several points. It's not simplified to, you're just an evil lich, either. It brings up points like, which factions of the undead do you want to support? Are you losing your humanity purely to win the war and afterwards you'll wander off, or is this a bid for new power? It's such an engaging campaign and there are nine other mythic directions you could go in. For example, the angel and demon paths have even more stuff to do, and a lot more relevancy to a good versus evil story than a bone man. Or mm. maybe you think a lich is too soft. And during the campaign you find a horrible swarm of ravenous insects. They're so awful that killing them off is near the best thing to do for anyone, unless you're really intrigued by them. You can conduct experiments so vile and evil that you can become a swarm that walks. Ah! You introduce the world to insect politics, where you devour everyone. Cities become... Uh, let, let me be very clear here. That's from Cronenberg's uh, film, The Fly. And that film is an outstanding retelling of the original film, The Fly. Um, we're going to rewind that again, because that is just absolutely gross. And I am so intrigued to play this game. To the viewing audience, type, type, type in the comment section below. Did you introduce this world to insect politics let's just go see that here real quick yeah this have even more stuff to do and a lot more relevancy to a good versus evil story than a bone man or maybe you think a lich is too soft and during the campaign you find a horrible swarm of ravenous insects they're so awful that killing them off is near the best thing to do for anyone unless you're really intrigued by them you can conduct experiments so vile and evil that you can become a swarm that walks and you introduce the world to insect politics, where you devour everyone. Cities become horrible hives, and you journey on looking for more meals. This is all excellent, though- Ugh. Oh, I just read that and my skin itches now. Ugh. Some mythic paths clearly have more to them than others. 
Something like Golden Dragon doesn't have much to it, or take much to unlock. They're not equal, but if you don't care about this stuff at all, you can become a mortal legend. This doubles your level cap and lets you level up faster, so you can dabble in all kinds of classes. So with alignment choices and mythic choices, it's one of the most replayable RPGs I've played. But my biggest hang-up is Act 4. Past the halfway point of the game, you're sent into the Abyss. There's no coming back until a chapter is done, so no overworld travel or any management stuff. You're instead trapped in the Chaos Realm of Torment, which, to be fair, does have a lot going for it. Being full of chaotic evil demons, nearly every mission has more going for it than it first looks. Everyone is trying to scam you, or use you, or stab you in an alley. Some of the most entertaining quests can be in the Abyss, but it's also a weird slog, and the circumstances of you getting here are strange. You're ordered into the Abyss by the Queen of Mendev to investigate the demons. Even if you're winning okay. the war, if she's unhappy with how you've done it, for some reason, she might also strip you of your rank, effectively banishing you there. For a lot of characters, this seems like a point to fight back rather than being sent to super hell. I don't think the story could function skipping the Abyss, but once you're there, you might be thinking a lot about if there was a way to avoid it. The main pain is navigation. They went to great lengths to make it actually feel like a realm of chaos, and they succeeded in that. When you rotate your camera, buildings, doorways, and entire landmasses can shift around. What the this heck? Take some time, which means some waiting before you can proceed. There are a few areas, like an empty bridge, where it's clear you do need to rotate the camera. Others okay. feel completely random, so even if you know where you need to be, how you get there can be challenging. Not to mention that while you're sometimes trying to figure out how to proceed, you sometimes get attacked by street gangs of demons. The missions will frequently cross districts too, which means lots and lots of loading. But even if you're in the right district, you might need to come from a different part of the district to get to where you want to go. You can unlock fast travel between the sections, which helps, but not as much as you'd hope. Because again, where you're spit out might not always be the most convenient pathway. And oh, checking no. for what could be the right way can take a while. Also, some quests don't have their locations marked correctly, or marked at all. I looked all over for the Den of Sweet Horror just to find out there was a room in a brothel. Like, the rotation idea is neat, and there are some fun puzzles attached to it, it's just how far this was taken. Holy if you're cow. you in the Crusade and the war, you've been ripped away from that to ride around on Satan's kaleidoscope. So you have fun missions, tedious now. Okay, well, um, there's a lot to do. Jeez, you, you, you could do anything. Navigation, and some really annoying fights. Anyone who is tempted to reroll their character or stop playing probably does so here. Just having quest directions be more clear would be a huge help, but even with that, it can definitely be a slog. It's like if the drow city from Baldur's Gate 2 was on a merry-go-round. I don't hate the Abyss, but if someone told me they did, I wouldn't need to ask why. You could power through the main stuff, but then you miss out on a lot of engaging side stories it has. Plus, visually, it's so different than everything else in the game. And seeing how these huge landmasses can shift around and over you is cool, but man, it's just such a pain in the ass. Then, as a lich, when I confront the queen later about all that, she says she sent me there out of fear. And... Yes! To the horde. Go guard the Tyrell building. Alright, let's get back to the crusade proper, and everything that comes with that. When you're put in charge of the Crusade after Canabras, you can recruit troops into multiple armies. Okay. These can move around and explore in the overworld just like your party does. Instead of resting, they just have a limited amount of time they can move per day. Their main purpose is to defeat enemy demon armies and capture outposts. The troops that you can recruit will refresh weekly, and you'll have some random mercenary units as well to consider. You might also get troops through regular quests, like if you save a squad of Hell Knights, now you have some Hell Knights on the campaign board. To get more and better troops per week means building up your infrastructure. Hmm. You construct buildings in the capital for more troops and upgrades, and can also build in the outposts you conquer. Structures can require a few resources, but like Kingmaker, gold can convert right into that. This way, all of your loot and treasures from murder hoboing can be pumped hmm. right into the war effort. All of this is heavily influenced by your decisions at the command table. Events will pop up that you need to make a decision on, and you can get new resources, or troops, or anything else really. You can put out decrees for researching relics or dealing with a crisis, and how you play the game can influence what events you can get, or your solutions to them. As a lich, many problem causers can be turned into loyal soldiers for the crusade. Whereas if you're trying to play as a good character, your solutions might need to be more diplomatic. What hmm. units you unlock in the battlefield are also based on your decisions. So flavor-wise, it's all fantastic. The units and abilities of your armies reflect your decisions. What your forces look like can vary wildly between playthroughs. My lich armies were mostly undead, with a few knightly orders in there. My angel army had paladins and inquisitors and other religious units. And the swarm that walks had more swarms. To give some examples, Ugh. troops can be merged back and forth between- All of a sudden my skin itches just thinking about the swarm that, that walks. That's just- oh god, that's gross. Between armies, and to make them progress further, you can recruit generals. 
They progress like your regular characters, getting new skills and abilities as they level up. Their victories unblock the way for your party, give you great rewards, and should be a perfect harmonious loop. Then the battles begin. Good. Get him! These are so fucking dull. They're not bad in a painful way, they're just so simple that... I'm struggling with how to word this. When people say they hate all forms of turn-based combat, these are like goggles to let you see the world through their eyes. It also falls apart in progression. This will be a mild... Okay, well I guess I'm... I guess I'm what the people would call a noob because I, I, I kind of think that it's cool. Okay, I can see someone type in the comment section below. Well, wait till you play the game, then you'll realize it's not cool. I, I understand. Everyone, please don't yell at me. Don't yell at me. I don't have time to play video games anymore. I don't have any any more free time. Spoiler, but here's the final army battle in one of my campaigns. Okay, that was pretty cool. Oh boy. The issue is, it feels like there's very little thought behind these battles. Where Heroes of Might and Magic 3 could feel like solving a puzzle, this feels mostly mindless. There were occasional fights where I'd think of Ugh. how to stack up spells and unit abilities, but it wasn't very often. The majority of the fights are decided at range anyways, either by your shooty unit or by your general casting a spell. There were multiple times I went up against an evenly ranked army where I just one shot it with a fireball. And this was all on the standard difficulty. Basic armies have few unit slots, and besides covering a wider area, there's no reason to not use a death stack. If an army is rated higher than a demon army, you overpower them and can automatically win. So the best thing you can do is get more general skills and choices to let you dump more units into one army. The only good things about the army combat are that it reflects your choices, and the novelty of playing it inside of a CRPG. Those elements still aren't enough to make it worthwhile, but it is nice having armies that help explore the overworld for you. And while you could set it to auto and never touch it, that's not ideal. You miss out on rewards like special items, and the map is unlocked to you in stages instead of you being able to control that. The best thing you could do is knock it down to easy, steamroll, and only have to fight sometimes. It's just a shame that what's supposed to be a big part of the game is utterly skippable at best, and at worst breaks the pacing. Especially when they did improve the Empire management. There are no negative events you have to crawl in, or other time wasters. The difference is in Kingmaker, a lot of the management supported the adventure. You might unlock an AC bonus, or get extra damage against a certain enemy type. Your choices can unlock unique buildings for your cities, which looped right back into those benefits. Wrath still has those elements, but they're streamlined down to focus on the war economy. You still get benefits in the field, but now a good chunk of them is diverted towards a skippable tactics game. There aren't really special buildings to unlock, and why would there be? You're organizing war logistics rather than ruling over a kingdom. The discussions of what units to unlock are way more interesting than actually using them. The writing is good enough that I wouldn't have minded if the crusade itself was more abstract and maybe only dealt with in these political meetings. You do get some stuff outside the battles based on your choices like that, but a good amount of it did go to the battles. What could have been a huge improvement over Kingmaker's management is instead an awkward side grade. Again, how everything connects is amazing, but the battles themselves not being fun is a fatal flaw. It's still a fantastic and dense RPG and you can't avoid all this stuff completely if you want to, I just wish it was better, since everything for the framework is all here. This brings us to the story, and I actually don't have much to say on the main hmm. plot. It's good, but I don't find someone like Arilu Vorlesh that interesting to go into detail on. You want Okay, um, what I'm looking at here looks like a... I'm gonna be... a um, controversial statement in 3, 2, 1. It looks like a modern laboratory. What kind of, uh, horrors are being done in this, uh... scientific lab? understand the villain, but they had so many other options open that you don't really sympathize with them. It's like dealing with a narcissist, where you understand how they're viewing the situation, but there are clearly other aspects they're either refusing to or unable to see. So you do understand her motivations, even if she's still nuts, and I appreciate that. I actually find the story of the war itself and how it progresses a lot more interesting. Everyone is willing to let a lot slide in the name of fighting demons. My Lich campaign was fantastic on that front. The crusade being twisted into an undead empire wasn't a light switch flip, it was a slow descent. People would be clearly uncomfortable with where things were going, but it's fighting demons, so let's not rock the boat too much. In fact, the loudest opposition and those actively trying to fight the Lich were some of the first to go. The party paladin even sat me down to say she's worried about where things are going and worried about me. 
It's like tapping into these powers are the equivalent of a hard drug problem, and I'm now at risk of Lich. A lot of my companions left or died during this campaign. Those nice enough to tolerate some atrocities got to witness firsthand as Bone Hitler devoured their comrades. My only remaining companions were either the most warlike and evil, or the most naive. Even if you don't go that route yourself, you'll see others who do, like kidnapping and lobotomizing people to try and fight their own war. You can condemn it, or go, hey, let me get in on that. There is a lot of wiggle room when you're fighting ultimate evil, but playing a good character, you'll find that things aren't that black and white. The Abyss has dozens of warlords, but only two are actively attacking. Why is Heaven barely interfering when they haven't come close to matching the escalation? It's not a grey there are no good guys tale, there are clearly evil forces at work, but it okay. does explore war as a cause. Some see the crusade as a chance for redemption, and others worked tirelessly inside of it and never got forgiveness even after nearly a century. Maybe the demons are capable of redemption too, and you can be worse than them. Everyone has different ideas on what the fifth crusade is or means. You can turn it into a grand reconciliation, a vengeful holy war, a grab for power, a way to gain favor with gods, all kinds of directions. How you got your powers and all that, I don't find nearly as interesting. I do think I'm- oh! Hold on, I'm real curious though. Um, obviously there's a lot more into the lore than I thought, but why are the forces of light, especially the forces in heaven, not getting involved? I mean, after four crusades that were horrible and abysmal, the fifth one is happening. Where are they at? What's going on? Uh, it's, it's something curious to really address. Uh, so somebody, please give me a summary about what's going on. I need a 10 out of 10 life-changing information in 3, 2, 1. Oh god, I forgot about Darwin. <laughs> DLC. I forgot about the DLC. There's still more coming out, but I'll go over what's out. First up is Inevitable Excess, which takes place right before the final battle. Your party is intercepted by an otherworldly force, as something has gone wrong in the space-time continuum. At first I thought that maybe this was a chapter cut for pacing, but there is something intriguing happening here. You go through some remixes of the game you've been through, fixing anomalies. And there's a few ways things can play out. However, it's too short to develop out its idea, and this is made for a max level party, meaning the combat is incredibly tedious. There is no such thing as a trash fight here, and you need to be on your A-game for all of them. Max level combat in these games means dealing with stacks of buffs and debuffs, and if you're not into that kind of combat where every system counts, you're not going to find a lot here on that side. There are some non-combat conundrums which are fun, but there's also the puzzles which are the most tedious in the game. Hmm. This feels like it could have been a fun and shorter side-off adventure that's been stretched out through the puzzles and the combat. If you beat it in a certain way due to space-time nonsense, all of your characters will get an extra power, and sometimes portals will open up in their game where they can find some extra loot. If you enjoy the high-level combat, then sure, otherwise it's skippable. Through the Ashes is another strange one. You create a new character who survived the Canabra's demon attack, and gather other survivors to try and escape to safety. This one's more experimental and feels like a survival game. You try and stop your friends from dying of disease, and you can use the environment a lot more in fights. It's a low-level adventure and clearly meant to be played on higher difficulties. It's an interesting but short idea for a one-off, but there's two things I don't get. For one, if you wanted lower stakes adventures in this setting, you could probably just go play Kingmaker and get it on sale cheaper than this. It is fun playing more gorilla where your big baddies are an undead local celebrity and a petty demon, but it's short and still ended with a to be continued which blew me away. I don't picture people clamoring for more of this compared to stuff in the base game, so I liked my time with it, I guess I'm just more shocked it's getting a follow up since it doesn't need one. The Treasure of the Midnight Isles. This is very similar to the Beneath the Stolen Lands one from Kingmaker. It's a roguelike dungeon you can access either standalone or through the main campaign. Though it is not well balanced inside of the main campaign. You can get crazy items early and fight bosses way harder than anything else in the main game. Its main appeal is the same as the other one, where you can quickly test builds inside of it. As an example, I made Dar from Beastmaster, except you can't actually get a tiger companion, so I got a wolf. Which is fine. In the movie, they painted the tiger black for some reason, and it turned out to have a horrible allergy to the paint. So a good chunk of the movie is watching the tiger get more lethargic and sleepy as it eventually- Oh no, that's- Oh no! Are you s- Oh, I don't want to see ant- uh, You could just- Oh no, really? Hold on, I'm rewinding that. I need to find out more about this. Jeez tiger Louise. companion, so I got a wolf. Which is fine. In the movie, they painted the tiger black for some reason, and it turned out to have a horrible allergy to the paint. So a good chunk of the movie is watching the tiger get more lethargic and sleepy as it eventually died on set. Not in my game. My
Well, that just ruined my day. I didn't need to know about that, but plus, hey, why have a wolf and you can have a Smilodon? A wolf has no known allergies. <laughs> eh, it's okay on sale. However, The Last Sarkorians is the easy recommend. You get new areas and quests, a new companion who's nature-focused, which was lacking in the main campaign, cool. a new class, new items and units, and it integrates perfectly into the main game. To the point that he has party interaction in the Excess DLC. You would think this is all part of the base game if you didn't know better, and that's how I prefer it. While I still like Kingmaker, this game blows out of the water in a lot of ways. It has mountains of content, tons of replayability, great writing and companions, and is the kind of game you could play a bit at a time for months on end. It's extremely flawed in the management side and some other areas are also janky, but for the amount of options it offers, it's hard to find better value in a lot of RPGs. It'll be on sale for a little over 10 bucks in the pinned link for the next while. They're gonna throw in DLC offers too, but weigh those carefully. Wrath of the Righteous is a gigantic game, so I'll- This looks like such a fun game. Uh, I mean, so much detail. Um, and I'm curious to hear how all of you have played it. Did you play as a walking swarm? Were you a lich? Were you a holy warrior? Were you a golden dragon? What faction did you play as? What race did you play as? What, what did you do? Were you a peacemaker with your team? Did you kill your team? Regale me with your stories. I need to know about the lore. I need a lore master to start explaining to this. Because why the hell, after not one, not two, not three, but four crusades, the forces of heaven don't intervene? I'll have something smaller next time. I'll see you then as long as I don't start another playthrough. Attack my narcoleptic but otherwise healthy dinosaur. <laughs> no! Please tell me you can get a T-Rex. How do I combat the potential of burning out on games like Pathfinder? I mean, it sure helps when they're fun. Mainly just playing yeah. it over a longer period of time. I don't think those kinds of games are really meant to be blitzed in a week or something. Not only do the games last longer, but you've spent so much time with the characters by that point that the big moments also hit harder. How do I organize my game library? On the digital side, GOG Galaxy lets me mark games that are completed, so I have that as the first kind of round. But after that, it's all by genre. For physical stuff, I don't have a gigantic amount of games, so they're not really that organized. What's a good tabletop RPG, not Pathfinder or D&D? If you like the role-playing side over lots of abilities and systems kind of thing, you might really like Alien RPG. Combat is fast and brutal, and it's a lot of fun. Thoughts on D&D becoming more casual versus Pathfinder. Peso does a great job, but for D&D, I don't think streamlining is the issue anymore. It looks to me that Wizards of the Coast are just insane, and I don't think past that. Uh, curious question, um, because I used to play a little bit of Dungeons and Dragons back in the day, uh, I've been seeing a lot of, uh, a Bruin and some storm clouds around D&D, &D. um, what's going on? Can someone, can, so and look, let's all respect each other's opinions, because I don't know, so maybe I stepped on a landmine, but can somebody be neutral enough to explain what the heck is going on? I Like I said, I sometimes just don't have a lot of time to read as much. I've been hearing some rumors, some rumbling. Would someone be as kind enough to explain it? And let's be respectful, because, I, I again, I know people have different opinions. So just give me a neutral perspective. I'm biased. With that being said, uh, shout out to this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful YouTube channel. 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 Mandalore Gaming. Uh, I'm encouraging everyone to please support the original content creator. This video probably took a lot of time and effort to edit and put together for all of us to enjoy. We give the original link in the description box below. So if you're watching this uh, wonderful React video, please support the original content creators. It's, it's the right thing to do. We do that for all of our videos that we react to because... Hey, it's a Chicago way. Be a hip, cool cat. Do that. But also, please be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe, and hit that ring bell notification. That way, you're made aware we upload new content onto our YouTube channel. And my goodness, I am so humbled, humbled by the growth of this channel and all of you are making it happen. Please give us your feedback. Do you like us when we react to these videos? Uh, or is there any other kind of react videos that you want us to see that are similar to Mandalore Gaming? We won't know unless you give us your feedback. And that's why we love you guys and gals. That's why you're hip cool cats and you're
right here in the heart. So with that being said, take care. All the best to you. Keep your heads on a swivel. And uh, God, my skin feels so itchy after hearing about that uh, the walking swarm. Just that ugh, insect politics. Ugh. If you haven't seen The Fly, don't watch it on a full stomach, okay? A lot of body horror. A lot of insect politics. So there you go. Uh, take care of yourselves. My name's Kit. This has been Chicago Reacts. Take care. Please be sure to support the original video. That's in the description box below. I'm up out of here. Keep on winning, folks.